Thank you. Love guys. you, bro. Love you, man. Right. Yeah, give me a hand. Definitely show him some love. I mean, look, here, here's the reality, right? Um, there's a reason why the Bible refers to them as the powers of darkness. Because if things can be kept hidden and never exposed, right? Name of the church, Illuminate. We're here to sh bring the light of Jesus Christ, to share the gospel in all of its beautiful facets. And as Mario said, there are people in the room that are feeling hopeless now. And it kind of relates to this, the, the text that we're actually in this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know, it's, it's, it's been said that there's another side to this life as well. And, and that is for, for many people, perhaps most people, all of life is just sort of this one long effort to avoid death. We don't talk about it much. We don't, we don't engage in conversations about it. And then what happens is someone close to you dies and you attend their funeral. And then it occurs to you, someday people are going to be talking about me. It's going to be me. And so we kind of push it aside. We kind of stuff it down and, and, and we don't think about it because of the fear that's there. Have you ever run out of gas? I was in Mexico, and I thought there would be more gas stations available than there were. And I kind of didn't think about it too much, but I could see the gas gauge just kind of dropping and dropping and dropping and, until it was too late. Life is kind of like that. Every day that passes by, your needle drops. Just a little bit. Almost unrecognizable, but it's... It's there and it's, it's dropping. And we don't want to think about it. But what if I told you that it's possible for you to live an absolutely fearless life? See, even as I say that, some of you are like, no, that's impossible. The most often repeated command in the Bible is what? Do not fear. Then it must be possible. Question, how? How is it possible? Now, this is where it gets kind of surprising. It might surprise you to know that the way for you to slay your fears actually comes through the death of someone else. So for the last several months, we've been working our way through this remarkable letter written by the Apostle Paul to a struggling church in the first century AD located in the city of Corinth. The title of the letter, as we know it, is 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 15 now. And last week, what we saw the Apostle Paul do was actually quite brilliant because this is one dysfunctional church. So he writes and he says, can I just tell you what the most important thing is? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves you. See, this church had thought, well, maybe it's our spiritual gifts that save us, right? That's the most important thing. Or what about our personal rights? They were suing each other and taking each other to court over these petty indifferences. Well, you have all these freedoms in Christ. That's the most important thing. And Paul says, no, actually, Christian maturity is putting self-imposed limitations on your freedom for the sake of another. No, none of those things are the most important thing. Of all the things I've written to you, here's the most important thing. Jesus Christ died for you, for your sins, so that you could have eternal life. And what that means is, Jesus has power over death. And because he has power over death, logically speaking, that means he can extend that power to whoever he wants to those who believe in him. Now, really the last major issue that Paul addresses with these believers is this. Some in the church were denying, disbelieving that there would be a physical bodily resurrection of the saints. And so Paul writes once again with a very pastoral corrective tone. And he says, here's the deal. If there is no resurrection of the saints, then we've got some really, really big problems. Bigger than you know. Chapter 15 and verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, which is the message that he's been giving, then how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So Paul says, let's think this through together. If they're dead, dead or not raised, that means that Jesus is not raised. Again, why? Because Jesus is the one that has the power over death. If he doesn't have power over death, I mean, if he's still in the grave, if he's still in the tomb, what good is the dead Savior? He doesn't have power. He doesn't have resurrection power. If he can't get it for himself, then there's no way he can extend it to you. And 
Therefore, your faith is in vain. That little Greek word for vain literally means empty. It's empty. And you have to love the honesty here. What Paul is saying is this. If Jesus is still in the tomb, then this is all a massive joke. Christianity is the biggest hoax in human history. And Christians should be pitied. That's what he'll go on to say. You know, it's, it's like we should just kind of be patted on the head and sent our naive and gullible, misguided way. He goes on, verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God. We're liars about what we say about God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. So you see this association he's going to make all throughout the text. If there is no physical resurrection for the saints, then that means that Jesus himself hasn't been raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And therein lies the real problem. Really, that is the gospel. The fact that all people are sinners separated from God. Why Jesus? To do for you essentially what you couldn't do for yourself. To bring to you the power that you don't have within you. Power, life over death. And if you haven't conquered sin's problem. See, that's the thing, right? I mean, that's, that's probably the thing that concerns us most about death, it just seems so permanent. You know, like it doesn't go away. And so he says, here's the deal. Your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. You can't make the payment on your own. And this is a big problem because it has eternal consequences. Verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep, that's a kind way of saying those who have died in Christ have perished. Question, how can dead people perish. Well, that's the larger context is eternal life. So sin brings separation, right? We talked about this before. What happens in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve sin, and what do they do? Immediately, they're like, you know, they go into hide mode, and we've been hiding ever since. And there's a separation. Uh, your spouse does something And he or she tries to hide it. Why? What happens? There's a serious disruption in your relationship. Your kids do something they know they shouldn't do. And what do they do? They hide it. And what happens to the relationship? There's a disruption in the Sin always disrupts relationships. There's a physical Spiritual consequence to our sin, verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, then we are of all people most to be pitied. I love, I absolutely love the soberness with which the scriptures are written. This is absolute brutal honesty. Again, it's as if he says, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, that is the linchpin of all Christianity then Christians should just be sent on their happy little naive ways. And while he was alive, theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking was widely considered one of, if not the smartest person on the planet. And in 2008, he was interviewed and he said this, quote, I regard the afterlife to be a fairy story for people that are afraid of the dark. So in other words, what he's saying is, is the belief in an afterlife is, is man's way of avoiding what is scary, of what causes him to be fearful, of, of the unknown. But what's interesting is the Apostle Paul's take on the afterlife, specifically his take on the afterlife of Jesus Christ, because he states it as a fact, not a fairy tale, but as a fact. Verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And so what Paul's going to do next is it's like he's taking this big old resurrection flag and he's just, he's just planting it in the ground. 
the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That's who Jesus is, first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does that mean? It's a, one way of saying that Jesus is the one who died, was buried, and was raised to life first. For, by a, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. What does he mean? He explains, for as in Adam all die. Because of Adam's sin, we're all sinners. We've all inherited that sinner's DNA. So also in Christ shall all be made alive. As by a man came death, Adam, so by a man shall all be made alive through Jesus. But each in his own order, Christ first, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So Jesus first, his followers second. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. Read the book of Revelation for more details about that. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Kind of hard for us to imagine because we're so surrounded by it. And in so many, certainly more so if you lived in the first century AD, average life expectancy. If you, if you were a man who lived to be 50 years old, you were considered fortunate. Surrounded by death. Can you imagine an existence? Death is unknown. Completely foreign. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says, quote, all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is ex accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subject subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. In other words, God the Father orchestrates the plan. Jesus executes the plan. And when the plan is executed, the result is eternal life. Jesus first, his death, his resurrection, and then his followers second. So Paul calls it a fact. Why would he do that? Well, for one thing, if you know Paul's story from the book of Acts, he actually encountered the resurrected Jesus Christ. What happens? He's traveling down this road to Damascus, and he was a Jewish zealot at the time. And he had papers in hand, like of official proceedings in order to find Christians and persecute them. And as he's traveling down this road, this bright light falls, he's blinded, and he hears a voice, and it's the voice of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, what are you doing to me? Which is interesting because technically if you persecute one of Jesus' followers, Jesus takes it very personally. It's like persecuting him. Why are you persecuting me, Jesus says. Something happened to Paul that transformed him. Now, if you're here this morning and you're a skeptic, can I just say, I am so glad you're here. I am so glad you're here. I've been praying for you. You're not here by accident. But here's what I want you to think about. If you're open-minded and open-hearted, there are certain imponderables that are very difficult to dismiss. Things like this. The Apostle Paul had everything to lose from a worldly perspective. He was the bright shining star. He was sort of like the Jewish poster boy for all things Jewish, right? I mean, he studied under the master teacher Gamaliel. He was on the fast track to becoming one of the premier rabbis in the land. And he had everything to lose. Something happened to him. And by the way, he, he had no book deal in the works. You know, it's not, like, it's not like Paul and his descendants got get royalties off of what we're reading, right? He had nothing to gain from this. He had everything to lose, as we'll see, nearly costing him his life day in and day out. What would cause such a transformation in a person? He saw the resurrected Jesus Christ, and then it was like, okay, wow, I guess Jesus is who he said he was. He did what he said he was going to do. See, and then later, Paul will write, Jesus actually appeared to 500 people at the same time. And then he says, they're still alive, which is another way of saying, if you're skeptical and you doubt, go ask those people. Go ask them about their experience 
and they will tell you that they saw Jesus. And then Jesus appears to a few more disciples who are traveling to this town called Emmaus. Hey, by the way, just last week, archaeologists believe that they found the town of Emmaus. It's about six or seven miles outside of Bethlehem. Jesus appears to them, and they wreck. Jesus did what he said he was going to do. In chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, all of this was done according to the scriptures. He says, I gave to you what is of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. What is he talking about? What are the scriptures? Well, they didn't have the New Testament in their day, but what they did have was the Old Testament. So when he says the scriptures, that's what he's talking about. So Paul says, hey, everything that I received and passed on to you about Jesus and the gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection, this stuff is all spoken about in the Hebrew scriptures, in the Old Testament, and with crazy specificity. For example, Isaiah 53, 5, the prophet says, but he was pierced for our sins, transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. When the angels appear and declare the birth of Jesus, what do they say? Peace on earth. And with his wounds, we are healed. Now, some of my very good Jewish friends take this as a reference to the nation of Israel, that the nation of Israel is oppressed and that they're crushed. But the specificity of these prophecies is kind of extraordinary. Chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth, just as the Gospels record. Psalm 22, I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Exactly what the soldiers did with Jesus. Psalm 22, 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The same exact words that Jesus cried out on the cross. Every one of these things spoken of in the scriptures. Paul says it went down just as the scriptures say. Additionally, in Matthew, Jesus says this about his three-day burial in reference to its Old Testament principle found in Jonah. He says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Let's keep going. What about the disciples? What happens to the disciples when Jesus is arrested? They're all like, um... A dead Messiah? Hmm, this isn't exactly fitting our idea. See, they read the Old Testament and they kept thinking, king, ruler, that's coming. Again, read the book of Revelation. Jesus is coming back. The first time he came, meek, mild, tender, child. When he comes again, he's riding a war horse. And he's bloody. (laughs) And he's putting all things in subjection under his feet. See, God is a God of justice. There will become a day when all will come a day when all wrongs will be made right. That day is coming. How do we know that? Well, because Jesus came once, so we know that He's coming again. The disciples were a scared group. They couldn't fathom a crucified Messiah, and so they're gathered together in this room and I love the details of the text. It says the door is locked and what happens? Jesus appears. And this guy named Thomas gets a really bad rap. Doubting Thomas? I don't think so. Realist Thomas. I can relate to him. He's a realist. Right? He's like, I'm not really buying this. Show me your hands. Let me see him. I'm going to touch him. And he does. And what does he do? He sees him and he touches him. And this Jewish man falls down and says to another Jewish man, my Lord and my God. Do you know how uncommon it is for one Jewish man to call another Jewish man his God? Why would he do that? That is absolute blasphemy unless you prove to be the son of God come back from the dead. Imponderables, imponderables. See, the scripture is filled with these imponderables. If you're open-minded and open-hearted, there's something perhaps for you to consider. So, there's one more little fascinating 
thing that Paul brings out of this, this text. Now, I've been laying down some sort of apologetic uh, scriptures for you, but let me give you some, uh, the big picture here because I want to I keep in the context within which Paul speaks. So this is what's interesting. Uh, in verse 20, he says the resurrection is a fact. Then in verse 21, he talks about Adam. You know, it's, Jesus doesn't quote Old Testament prophecy. He talks about Adam and Eve. Why? Because it's actually, it's really compelling. He says, actually the gospel, you find the gospel in all throughout the Old Testament scriptures. Where? Well, let's go back to the very beginning. Genesis chapters one and two. What happens? God creates, places man in this beautiful environment. Man rebels, he sins. He hides. And then God says, okay, I've got to formulate a redemption plan. And words are spoken to Adam, to Eve, and to the serpent, Satan. And what is spoken to Satan? There will be, this is Genesis chapter 2, an offspring of a woman that will crush you. That will give you a death blow. That will utterly destroy all of your works. And then you fast forward, Genesis 12 and 15, and we are introduced to this man named Abram. Later, his, change, his name gets changed to Abraham, and God reiterates these promises. From you, one will come forth that will be a blessing to all people, every family on earth. This is why in the Gospels, Matthew and Luke, they open up with what? The genealogy of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we know that he has to be from the line of David through Abraham. That's why you get the genealogy. He says, okay, let's just get this straight. We all know our Old Testament scriptures, right? Right? We're good Jewish boys and girls, and we understand that when the Messiah comes, he will be from this line. So the Gospels open up. Bam! Let me just share with you the lineage of Jesus Christ. Check that off. He fits. Garden of Eden, all the way through the book of Revelation, Jesus is there. The gospel is there. So Paul says, yes, in fact, Jesus was raised from the dead. He's going to come back. All things will brought, be brought to fulfill in order. Jesus first. That's happened. Those who believe in him, second. So there is a bodily, physical resurrection. And then we get this rather obscure statement. Otherwise, what do people mean, verse 29, by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? So this is a pretty obscure verse. Kind of perplexing, but just because it's obscure and perplexing doesn't mean we shouldn't try to understand it. So anything that we read from Paul, especially a sentence like this, we have to understand it must be taken within the context of everything else that Paul writes. And so as some of my Mormon friends believe, they take this to be a reference to salvation by baptism. But we know that can't be the case because that would be in contradistinction to what Paul writes in the book of Romans, that salvation comes by grace through faith. So what does this verse mean? Now, I'll give you my take on it. I can't be dogmatic about it, right? Uh, remember a couple, couple weeks ago we talked about open-handed issues and closed-handed issues? This is an open-handed one to a degree, right? Is Jesus the only way to God? Yeah, that's a closed-handed one. What do you think about this verse? Let's talk about it, but let's make sure you bring your Bible and put it in this larger context of everything that Paul writes. Here's what we know about the Corinthians. Uh, they were really jacked up <laughs> in every way. Uh, they didn't know how to take communion properly. Uh, they, they were arguing their personal rights. They were suing each other. They approved of the kind of sexual sin that those outside the church didn't approve of. Uh, it's like they had every basic Christian practice wrong, perhaps including baptism. And so what Paul is doing is he's essentially not affirming this, but he's actually pointing out the problem. Again, I can't be dogmatic about it, but I think it's possible that that's what he's speaking of. Now to the larger point, when most people think of resurrection, and this is, please listen carefully, when most people think of bodily resurrection, they have all of these really good thoughts about the life to come. And they think about heaven. And, and they think very narrowly about the implications of what an afterlife is about, right? And that makes sense. But what Paul does next is amazing. It's so profound because he says, here's what the resurrection means. 
let's not think about the future. Let's think about what the resurrection means now for you. you say, now for you? He says, yeah, let me use myself as, as an example. Here's what the resurrection means for me. Verse 30, right? If the dead are not raised, then why are we, himself and the other apostles, why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? Did he literally fight with beasts at Ephesus? I suppose it's possible, but from what we know about his time at Ephesus, he faced a lot of human opposition from Jewish zealots and from the cultists. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He's capturing some very famous Epicurean thought. Hey, the Epicureans are right. We should... We should decide with them. If there is no resurrection, there's implications for today. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So this is really interesting. Paul says, let me tell you how I live out the resurrection here and now. I'm putting my life on the line every single day. How about you? Think about it. Because my future... My eternal future is secure. I'm fearless. What are you going to do to me? Kill me? You just send me to the prize. So I'm going to live here and now because of the resurrection absolutely fearlessly. See, in, in 2 Corinthians, he has to write another letter to the church. It seems they don't quite get it. And in that letter, he uses a bit of sarcasm. And he says, you know, you all are listening to these voices of people who take advantage of you, but you won't listen and receive my voice. And then he goes on and compares himself to them. And in doing so, he lays down some street cred. Verse 22, he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. In other words, he says, I've got some pretty good credentials. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. And then he says, I'm talking like a madman. It's like, it's crazy for me to even have to prove myself. I'm far greater labors than them, far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one, right? And you know what this was like. It's a whip. At the end, there's sort of these leather straps. And at the end of the leather, leather straps are these pieces of bone. And they were just meant to rip flesh. If Paul was here and we said, hey, Paul, just kind of lift up your shirt and show us your back. I think, you know, you'd, you'd probably be somewhat horrified. The dude had scars, you don't think he believed in the resurrection of Jesus? Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That's with rocks, kids. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness at sea from false brothers. In toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. That theology that speaks of you just wanting to be happy. So along with all of the physical torment, there is the mental anguish. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me. He says, I'm anxious. I've got anxiety. But what is it that made Paul anxious? Man, when I think about the churches and I think about their struggles, Corinth is one of them. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Who is made to fall and I'm not indignant? This is a very good pastor. This is what you want. This is a pastor's heart. Every day I'm facing danger and death. You know, every time I plant a church, it might be my last. But nothing is going to stop me because I'm absolutely fearless, man. I'm a savage for the gospel. Now, at this point, you might be thinking of Leonidas in that epic movie 300. Chiseled abs, a sword in hand. He's like, if that's your image of Paul right now, you couldn't be more wrong. Paul doesn't have a sword in his hand. He has a book. He's an academic. What makes a guy like Paul fearless? Answer. A proper understanding of the implication of the gospel of Jesus Christ and all of its facets, including resurrection. Are you fearless? 
What are you afraid of? Come on now. What are you afraid of? Let me give you a little encouragement this week. Show just a little, little courage. Little acts of courage. Like what? Let people know that you're a Christian. Identify yourself as a Christian. Slay your fear of being alone that is keeping you in a very dysfunctional relationship. Slay your fear of being known and get involved in a rooted group. There's about 450 people that are signed up now. Stop by the lobby, say, that's it, it doesn't matter. I gotta stop isolating myself. I gotta get in the context of others, right? I need to be in that spiritual environment where I can, let my, where I can have my spiritual root, roots grow and experience the one another's of scripture. I gotta stop being isolated. If we're in isolation, we'll get picked off. Be together. Slay your fear of control, your fear of humiliation that drives you toward anger and revenge. See, if you're not experiencing an ever-increasing fearlessness in your life, then you are not being obedient. This is not all there is. What could possibly be keeping you from stepping out and stepping into what God has for you. Think of it this way. If you get robbed of 50 cents, and that's, if you get robbed of 50 cents and you have a million dollars in the bank, what is that to you? That's nothing to you. But if you get robbed of 50 cents and that's all you have, you're going to be devastated. Right? It, you're going to be like, well, that was all the money I had to eat. Brothers and sisters, you have untold riches awaiting you in heaven. How's that? How's that? What's going to be taken away from you that's going to so disrupt your life? Be fearless. This is not all there is. Live today in light of eternity. Father, our deep heart's desire is that your spirit would continue to do his work in our lives, stirring us up toward love and good deeds. We think of what Paul says in Romans. God, if you are for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave himself up for us. Will he not give us all good things? So Father, as we enter into this time, may we remember that you are that cornerstone. You are the foundation of our lives. And what that brings us, not only meaning in the life to come, but here and now. We pray this in the name of the one who makes it all possible. As always, his name is Jesus Christ. And God's people said, amen. amen.